you there. All right, go ahead, sorry. Okay, now the presentation is being recorded. I've already finished the five slides. So what I've talked before is that solar flare events are really important and we're studying solar flare events um, prediction problems. And the object of study is called active regions. Um, so from, um, from a statistics, statistician's perspective, we always care about what type of observation is available and how good or how bad they are and how we can make use of it. So here I'm, uh, I'm listing the kind of observations that's available to us. There are several data sets that we look at. One is called the GOES data set and the other is called the HMI SDO data set. Um, and the GOES data set essentially give us a time series of flare events or some labels of flare events. Um, and it's containing the flare list. So it's containing information like what is the start time, peak time, and end time of a certain flare? And what is the flare intensity level? And what is the class of, the, of that particular flare? And also, which actual region this flare is originating from? So that's the ghost data set that we have. And for us, it's, it's essentially the response for machine learning models. So essentially, we have a time series of events or class labels, and we are trying to predict on uh, the flare events from this. And in our study, we only focus on the peak time of the flare, which is the most important part. Um, and also from the HMI SDO data set, we get, um, we get so-called magnetogram or sharp parameter information. So those are the sharp patches. They contain 2D photospheric maps of three orthogonal magnetic field components. Um, and this provide a time cadence of 12 minutes. And in our current analysis, we, uh, we use, we tried models with both 12 minute time cadence and one hour time cadence. And the difference it makes is not, is very trivial. And for this data, for the 2D maps, um, some parameters are calculated and they're called sharp parameters. And they are, they are aimed at capturing the structure and the complexity of the magnetic field. So those are the defined, um, defined features extracted from those images uh, based on our physical understanding of the solar flare events. And from this, uh, we obtain our so-called predictors or covariates uh, in our machine learning model. And those could be images. Uh, and because we are dealing with a time series, so we have videos, or they could be vector features and they still come with a time series. So that's the data sets that we're currently working on. And related to flares, there's another data set called the AIA data set, uh, which we also have and we're looking into. But for the, for the rest of this talk, I will not talk about the results based on AIA images. So I just want to briefly mention the opportunities and challenges about solar flare predictions. And there is opportunity for both the solar physics and machine learning communities. I remember in my first ever uh, conversations with the space scientists about the solar flare predictions, they told me if you could ever predict the peak time of a flare event, the rest of the decaying phase is really simple for us. And we have almost a perfect model to, to, to finish the rest of the task and also predicting its impact on the earth. So for, for, for solar physicists, as long as we could give them a good prediction about the peak time of a flare events, everything follows will be really, um, it's already kind of done for them. And that's, that is what I describe as attractiveness for them. They really want to use the machine learning outputs as an input for formal analysis, that means the physics models. And they do have a lot of data. They told me they have large, large data sets and it's at, at very high resolution uh, and a very high time cadence for all three sets of data that we're looking at. And from a machine learning or statistic perspective, this is a very challenging problem. Um, and because um, although they're telling me we have a really huge data set, and I thought probably I can do some scalable computation here. And to my surprise, 
are not surprised. Uh, they really, really don't have a huge data set. They're, they're dealing with a small big data problem in the sense that the volume of the data is really large, but the independent, uh, effective independent number of events is really small because the strong events are really rare. And that's the object of our study. And for this strong events and rare events, it's really important um, to quantify uncertainty, for example, because the, those are very rare. And we do observe through our studies that there's strong heterogeneity across the different events and across the different active regions. By this, I mean, for different active regions, they demonstrate very, very different um, features in terms, of, in terms of emitting strong flare events. And even for the same active region, just the two strong flare events happening at the earlier phase or at a later phase demonstrate very different triggers and different mechanisms um, for, for eruption. So that's creating extra trouble for the formal analysis. And furthermore, we do have high resolution images at a very high time cadence, and we do want to use them directly. And that will cause a lot of computation and storage efficiency problems for us. And currently, for our model, for, for the current model that we are working on, we're not dealing with the entire big data set, as I was describing, because there are many terabytes. We're dealing with um, gigabytes of data currently after some kind of cleaning and processing. But at the end of the day, probably want to use the raw data to do something. And here I'll just briefly talk about our workflow. So the final goal for us is, can you tell me when is the next strong flare happening? And if such a flare event is happening, what is the magnitude, what is the intensity of that particular flare? So in order to achieve this final goal, we try to break, break down uh, this bigger problem into smaller and practical steps because this is a, not a trivial question to answer. So the first uh, step that we go is to classify the strong flare events from the, uh, from the weak flare events. And this is gonna tell us what kind of features or precursors will lead to a big eruption versus a small one. So question one is, um, is studied in the solar physics community using the off-the-shelf machine learning methods such as support vector machine and random forests for a while. Um, and people have uh, obtained a different source of results. And it's more of a feasibility study to my, to my understanding. Um, and the second task for us is to forecast the local peak flux of any flare versus quiet time. For the active regions, for majority of the times, it's really quiet, there's no flares happening. And whenever there's a flare, uh, we are interested in the peak flux of that particular flare. And that's the uh, flare intensity that we're trying to predict. And for this one, we're trying to, again, trying to learn what kind of features will lead to an eruption of what certain level versus nothing. And the third task is to really do the time to event modeling for flare arrival time. And for the people who have studied the flare list, the ghost data set and the flare distribution, for, for example, the power law projects, people know that there are a lot of missing flares, especially for the weak flares. And this is creating more trouble for the time to event modeling for flare arrival time. And also the flares demonstrate high dependency in terms of the intensity and their arrival time. So this need, uh, this needs complicated stochastic modeling for the flare arrival time. And finally, we want to do online inference and that's the streaming inference that's needed to do, um, to, to make it operational forecasting. Um, and also we want to do individualized predictions for each active region. As I mentioned by our initial analysis, we found that there is strong heterogeneity across active regions. And if we could make it personalized, that would be great. And in this talk, I'll briefly mention our results from task one and two, and three and four are ongoing. So the task one is classification of strong from weak flares. 
So the method that we used for classification is this so-called long short-term memory neural network. It's quite effective for sequence prediction problem. Our, our input is the time sequence of the sharp parameters from the HMI SDO dataset, as I mentioned. And the output is the binary label of a strong versus weak flare event. And this is our results for the strong weak flare classification. And what I'm showing here is the rock curve um, for different time, different lead time predictions. So the red solid line is the 48 hour lead time and the uh, blue solid line is the 24 hour lead time and the black is 12 hour lead time and the dashed lines correspond to the six hour and one hour lead time prediction. And uh, Yang, yes. question. Uh, so when you say cl uh, classification, I mean, you, you're saying that whether it's an um, uh, M or X versus um, A or B, uh, right? Yeah. A, B or C. So essentially it's M, X versus B because for the entire data set that we have, there is only one A, A, A okay. that is recorded. Uh, but so when you, I mean, what, what exactly are you doing when you're doing the classification? I mean, in, in the sense that your data set already comes pre-classified, right? So what, what is, uh, which part of the data are you? Uh, so we accepting? split the data into training and testing. And we train, uh, we train the data, uh, we train the classification model based on the training data, and then try to predict the labels for the testing data, and then quantify our results based on the testing data. And so what are you using for the training and the? Yeah, so we try the different kind of training testing splits. One is the um, based on based on time. For example, we use the data from before the year 2015 as training, and then try to predict all of the flare events after the year 2015. So uh, can I just ask, just to follow up on that, in, in, there must be some sense in that in further data you won't have this classification. No, so, so let me try to clarify this thing. So the so the objective is that uh, given the current data that we have, we want to train a model that's able to take in sharp parameters and then output flare predictions. But so if you so, have the classes, why are you trying to predict the classes? So, so this is really quanti trying to um, quantify the results for out of sample prediction. So, um, so in, in statistical models, we try to put all of our observations in our data and then trying to assess goodness, goodness of fit. However, mm -hmm. in this prediction problem, the things that we want to, um, we want to, uh, we want to demonstrate the out of sample performance. So we just choose part of the data as training data to fit our model. And after we obtain the prediction model, we try to predict the binary labels for the data in the testing set, and then try to compare with the ground truth. Because for the testing set, we also have the binary labels. Sure, so, but why don't you just, why? If so you have the labels, why are you trying to predict the labels? Oh, so the, 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 the purpose of fitting this model is really, for example, uh, we want to predict in real time what's going to happen. So, however, if I have this model, I cannot really demonstrate whether my model is better or other people's model is better. So, in order to you're saying, are you saying that it, you are, in fact, expecting that for future data sets, but maybe because you're trying to do prediction, you won't have the classification? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, that was my yeah, initial that's, question. That's the entire. That's the entire purpose for the for training the prediction model. In the future, data the, sets, the, we then only the question have is: In the future, will there be some so, some way that the, the 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 data that you have to classify, the flares or possible flares that you have to classify, are different than the classified yeah. flares? And if that's the case, then you would like your training and test set to represent that similarly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I had a follow up question. Um, I might have missed this in the previous slide, but what is uh, the definition of strong and weak flare? Oh, yeah. so in terms of flares, um, they they are classified based on their flare intensity. 
So strong flare means intensity above a certain threshold and weak flare means intensity below a certain threshold. So in general, there are five different classes of flares, A, B, C, M, X. And M, X are supposed to be strong flares and A and B are supposed to be weak flares. And C flares are just uh, some, somewhere in between. And the boundary for these flares are not clear because they're next to each other. So, so, so ultimately, there's, there is a um, continuous variable, actually, that you're predicting. Yes, exactly. So yes. why even go through the classification uh, step? Why build a neural network to predict classes of a continuous variable when you could just yeah. build a regression model to predict yeah. the output? <laughs> Yeah. You know? So our next our next uh, task is really to predict the flare intensity. However, okay. the problem is not as trivial as a regular regression model. First of all, in the in the entire time time sequence, a lot of the weak flares are suppressed or not observed. We have a ton of missing data in our problem. The original distribution of the flare intensity should be power law, but what we observe is really like a Gaussian type. Um, distribution for the flare intensity. Um, so that's adding trouble for the flare intensity prediction. And second, in practice, we do care about when is the strong flare happening. Instead of caring about all flares of all intensity levels, um, practitioners care about strong flares. So the indicator of a strong flare happening is like a warning, it's like an earthquake, earthquake is coming. So this is what we want to do in practice. And that's what the majority, if not all the, of the literature is focused on. Okay, thanks. Uh, so one, one more follow up from me. So your data that you're using to, um, uh, to do the classification is actually the sharp uh, parameters, not necessarily the, uh, the ghost data, right? I mean, it's the so You're just using the ghost data to uh, label. Uh, yeah, the ghost is only the label. We're not using the ghost for other purposes. We're only using the ghost flare list, not other parts of the ghost data. Okay. okay. Yeah. So this is part of the results. Um, my point is not trying to show whether the result is good or bad. The thing that I want to point out is that there's a big difference between the prediction performance uh, when the prediction time horizon is below or above 24 hours. And this is kind of uh, the results that we based purely on the data. And it matches with the physics intuition that the flare precursors start to form almost a day ahead of time. Um, and here I'm just showing some uh, metrics for the 24 hour lead time prediction of the first strong flare, that's the MX flares. And we're, we're doing really well in terms of the prediction performance as compared to the results in the literature. Uh, one thing is that we're using this uh, temporal dependency neural network instead of using stationary uh, features uh, to, to predict this flare events. And currently we're working on a follow-up work on trying to make this results interpretable uh, and trying to figure out what is the thing that's contributing to the good prediction results that we have? Um, and the other thing that we worked on is trying to use um, a machine learning algorithm to do automatic feature extraction. So as I mentioned, the sharp parameters is based on the current understanding of the physics of the solar flares. And probably it's not the it's not representing um, the, the reality or people are having a partial understanding of the flare uh, precursors. So if we could use the entire magnetogram information, that would be great. But the magnetogram images or the videos are of very, very large size. Uh, and training a model directly on that is really not feasible uh, for our current uh, computation. Um, facilities. And what we did is that we used uh, an autoencoder, which, which is an image reconstruction technique to actually extract features directly from the magnetograms and trying to see if we could construct the features 
purely based on data-driven methods instead of based on physics and try to see whether this kind of data-driven methods can outperform uh, the physics-driven methods or not. So the other encoder has two different things. One is called an encoder and the other is called a decoder. So the left-hand side is representing the three layer, um, the three channels of the images that we have. And the right-hand side is representing the reconstructed three channels of the images that we have. And through a bunch of neural network operations, we obtain this hidden layer. And this is the layer of the feature space that we extract. And we're hoping that this hidden layer, because it's, it's able to reconstruct the image pretty well, it should be represent important features about the particular image. And we use this hidden layer as vectored features in our machine learning models. So here are just some results based on the image reconstruction. So uh, I'm giving six different examples. Um, in each of this, uh, these plots is showing the results of a particular active region at a particular time. And the top panel is the original observed magnetogram and the bottom is the reconstructed magnetogram. So we're capturing the essential features of the magnetogram um, with this autoencoder algorithm. And the three different columns represent to the different channels of the, of the magnetogram. And because the number of features that we get from this autoencoder is still large, it's more than 65,000. And we use um, the, the, the method called marginal screening to actually screen the features down to less than 6,000 uh, to put into our new network. And this is trying to avoid a lot of overfitting or the, um, the dependency about, uh, or among the different features because we have way too many features than is needed in practice. Um, and the results is here. Um, Again, we are trying to classify the strong versus the weak flares. And this is based on uh, the marginal screened features. And the rock curve, actually, if you look at the rock curve and AUC, it's actually very similar to the results that we obtained based on the sharp parameters. And so far, we haven't really got to the conclusion of whether the physics, uh, the physics inform the features are better or the uh, or the autoencoder ex extractive features are better in practice. So and are you, I'm sorry. Are you showing us both the autoencoded and the scientific features here? No, this is only the autoencoder features. So how do we know that they're the same? Um, I'm not talking about they are the same. They are very similar in terms of the area under the curve. If you compare, oh, so maybe we just have to remember the slide three back. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's the slides before. And so 48, then, you don't have, you need to have different hours too. No, I don't have so many hours because again, for computational efficiency, for the autoencoder, we didn't extract very long videos. We only extracted features for 12 hour long. Is that a, I guess, is that a, that's, I guess, a, a, a downside of the automatic features then you can't use it with long. Yeah, it is. Yeah, because for autoencoder is another neural network that you really have to train and has to converge. Yeah, that is the downside of the um, of the feature extraction. But for the physics feature uh, extraction, it also takes several hours to extract those set of features from a video, so it's not trivial either. And, but you end up with it, not 6,000 features, but a, a, a much smaller number of features. Yeah, that it's like 20 features. And each of those features, uh, of the, the solar physicists would attribute some meaning to. So it's yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the previous model, if we had built a statistical model, currently we actually have that one of those, those models, it's highly interpretable because each of those features is representing a different type of physics. For example, there are things like total potential energy, mean shear, and things like that, that's representing different physics. And here I'm gonna show uh, some quick, quick question about uh, uh, these features that you find. Is it possible to sort of 
um, figure out what their weights should be? I mean, rank them in terms of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, have, uh, we do have feature ranking uh, based on some backward el elimination algorithms uh, in our paper, yes. Okay. Yeah, feature importance is really quite important in practice uh, because it helps people to understand um, what kind of uh, physics is more important for a certain type of their events. Um, I'm going to show some case studies um, because, as I mentioned, what we want to do in practice is that we have this trained model and we want to predict on a different active region. And then this active region is giving us time series of sharp parameters. And in real time, we want to see is there any flare happening in this active region. So here I'm going to do uh, four different case studies. After we train our model, we try to apply that to four different active regions, and those are pretty representative active regions. Um, so the blue curve here is our trained uh, prediction score. That is the probability of a strong flare happening in the future. And then the blue ticks, oh no, the green ticks is showing the C-class flare events, and the red ticks are showing the M-class events. Um, and the numbers behind the, the M class events is just the, the intensity in the M class events. Um, and as we could see, uh, around 20 to 24 hours before the first M flare event, that's the strong flare event, we see a very sharp transition of the prediction score climbing from a very low value, that's almost a zero for those plus and almost 0.5 to almost a one. So that means uh, the flare precursors um, constructed in the neural network actually appear around 20 to 24 hours before the first strong flare event of an active region. Um, and this, is, this result is highly promising because for physics-based models, the prediction time horizon that they could achieve probably is only 30 minutes to one hour. Um, however, if we track the active region for a very, very, for a very long extended time point until the active region dies, that means it moves all the way until we can't see it anymore. Then we see some problems. So the first, again, this is the same active region, 11158. Um, for this active region, again, we see a sharp transition of the prediction score. And then after the last, of flare, last of strong flare event, and which is the M class flare here in the red tick, the prediction score drops all the way down to zero again, which is great. Uh, that's what we do expect. However, for another active region, our prediction score already dropped almost to zero before a few hours before the last M class flare happening. And this is really bad result. And um, again, and for this last, which is 11532, another active region that's pretty representative. Uh, a contradiction, uh, um, a different thing, if, um, phenomenon is happening. Many hours after the last strong flare class, uh, strong flare happens, our prediction drops to almost zero. So this is revealing some problem in our data pre -pro uh, processing and our, in our data model training. And we do want to avoid those kind of phenomena showing in this plot. Uh, question? Yes. Uh, do you always see large lead times uh, between when the probability goes up and the first um, M-class uh, flare happens, like tens of hours? Or is it, um, is in it better? In most of the active regions, in most of the active regions, yes. And it's, uh, so, and what is the smallest time that you see uh, for this thing? Smallest time, probably a few hours, like this one. This is a pretty difficult active region to predict. Okay. Yeah, because so the, 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 the magnitude of the sharp parameter matters, but also the, the rate of the increase of the sharp parameter matters. So we could capture the precursors very early on when it starts to increase, not even to, to a very large value. But shouldn't the um, classification program account for this uh, delay? I mean, shouldn't it uh, shouldn't it come out that um, 
you know, after the sharp parameters reach a certain point, it should take a certain time before the first yeah. layer actually goes off. Yeah, ideally, the lead time should be exactly equal to our specified lead time. However, in practice, it's not what's happening because again, the the we only have so many uh, strong flare events. I remember more than 200, a little bit more than 200 over the past 10 years of data. Um, and and the, the, the different flare, strong flares have different triggers and they have different relationships with their sharp parameters. Um, so what we're training is regarding that there's a same relationship between the sharp parameter and the flare class. And this is giving us the result that the lead time prediction that we're having using this binary classification training method is really not ideal. Okay. And this, I mean, this is the one initial model that we trained, trying to really study the, the features of the data set and trying to study the feasibility of the predictions. And there are a lot of things that we didn't take into account in this very preliminary model. And the data preparation is also problematic um, for, for, um, for real-time forecasting, for example. Uh, one other question. So about the top right case that you have. Um, yeah. That's really it, bad. Yeah. Uh, is it possible that um, your sharp model uh, is confused uh, because you're, you know, the active region is rotating out of view and everything is foreshortened and you may not have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everything near the limb is really, mm -hmm. is really difficult because the active region will have a very bright uh, red patch that's not really part of the mag magnetic field. Oh. Um, but in our data preparation, we try to remove that part. Okay. Um, but still, it's, it may not be as successful. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the questions. I mean, for this first model, it's really um, one trial on the easiest problem coming from this data set. And for the current model, the, 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 the things that we require the flare events in our model training to not overlap in an extended period of time to get the independent flare, event, uh, flare events in our training and testing. However, the flares are actually demonstrating a time sequence uh, and dependency structure. So let us go to, uh, I'll skip this part. So let us go to the next task, which is about flare intensity prediction. As I mentioned uh, to Casey's question, this is not a trivial regression problem um, for, um, because of um, different complications. So in this flare intensity prediction project, we try to forecast the local peak flux of any flare versus quiet time. So again, our data set is really big. The way that we try to uh, make the data set a bit smaller or more easy to handle for our model training is to define the local peak flux for 24 hour moving windows instead of looking at every single time point because for the entire horizon, we have 10 years of data and we have uh, thousands of active regions, hundreds of active regions and thousands of flare events. Um, and the data size is really big. And majority of the active regions are in quiet time without flare. Um, so we are dealing with a highly unbalanced sample um, and a large, uh, large set of time series data. So we, uh, we, 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 we proposed this model called the mixed LSTM regression model for flare intensity prediction. And for statisticians, you can understand it as a mixture model of a binary indicator and a, another regression model. So here are some details. Instead of doing the flare classification, we try to predict the flare intensity. And this is enabling us to include the majority flares, which is the C-class flares in the model. We have more than 2,000 C flares um, in the past 10 years. And beyond the flares, we also include the non flaring time in the data. And this is accounting for majority of the data, um, majority of the, of the time points. So we're trying to 
um, aim for less information loss for this model. And the byproduct for us is that we still could obtain a flare classification model because as soon as we have the intensity predicted, we could have the classification. And the result is that by doing using this new model, we get better classification results than our previous model. So in this case, uh, in the machine learning work, uh, instead of defining a likelihood function, we define something called loss function. And in our loss function, we try to balance the two different things that we have. One is the cross entropy loss for the quiet time indicator, whether a particular time point is all quiet or is having a flare event. And the second loss is the squared error loss, which is the for the flare intensity. And here we're using the square error loss for the logarithm of the flare intensity, uh, which looks more like Gaussian shape. And then we have to balance those two different losses in our loss function. So finally, our loss function is defined in this way. Um, we're trying to uh, balance the cross entropy loss and the squared error loss uh, for, for the quad time indicator and the flare intensity. And we're trying to train the weights uh, based on cross validation such that um, we're trying to, we're balancing the quad time versus the active time and also balancing the different flare classes so that the auto-sample auto performance will be reasonable. Um, and here are just some results. Um, on the right-hand side is the result based on the training data, and on, on the left-hand side is the result based on the testing data. The x-axis is plotting the real intensity, the observed intensity in the log 10 scale, and the y-axis is plotting the predicted intensity in the log 10 scale. Um, and the strong flare events, MX, are in the blue and the dark blue colors. And what we're aiming for is that this, this, um, this upper corner does not overlap too much with the lower corner, which means we do not mix the super strong flares with the weak flares. So uh, for the training data, everything is very, very near the 45 degree line, which means the result is pretty good. For out of sample performance, uh, we are having majority of the blue dots in this right corner. However, we do have a few uh, misclassification going on for the testing data. Um, and here are some results uh, from this mixed LSTM regression. Here I'm showing four different active regions and in each active region, I have two different panels. The top panel is the prediction score that is the probability of, uh, of being active versus quiet. So as you can see, whenever we have a lot of flare events happening in this time range, the prediction score is always high up there near one. And then in the bottom panel, again, I'm using the different dots to indicate the flare events, blue for B flares, um, green for C flares and red for MX flares. That's the strong flare events. And what we're predicting is the local peak flux. And the blue curve that I'm showing here is capturing the local peak flux um, as we go across the time horizon. Um, and similar things is happening for other hop regions as we're showing here. Um, the prediction score is always high whenever there's a flare event going on and the curve is capturing the flare intensity, local peak flare intensity pretty well for all of the other hop regions. And uh, for this mixed LSTM regression, the only case that we did not, did not do super well is the case when the strong flare event happens very close to the end time of this active region. Uh, and that's related to the limb problem that Vinay was talking about. So this result, this model is actually pretty successful in terms of capturing both the active activeness of the active region and also the flare intensity. Um, so I'll conclude soon and leave more time for discussions because uh, again, this work is pretty preliminary and there are still a ton of ongoing work that we're working on. Um, so I have presented our first work on classifying strong flares from the weak flares. 
Uh, and we have another model to focus the local peak flux of any flare versus some quiet time and achieve uh, some successful results uh, based on prediction. Um, and currently, this is working in progress. We're working on the time to event modeling for the flare arrival time. So essentially, we're trying to use a stochastic process modeling, um, like an inhomogeneous in person process um, modeling, uh, borrowing ideas from the earthquake prediction literature and trying to estimate the flare arrival time with quantified uncertainty. We have some preliminary results for this, um, but it's, um, I don't have it here. Uh, and for the online and individualized predictions for each active region um, is still to be done because um, the modeling will be another layer of compli uh, complexity as compared to the previous tasks. Um, and here I'm just listing some references. Uh, the first paper is about the binary classification of the strong flare events. And the second paper is trying to study the flare prediction based on solar cycle dependence. And the third paper is the flare prediction, uh, flare intensity prediction. And the fourth paper is trying to obtain post hoc analysis for neural network prediction uh, using statistical models and trying to interpret the good results um, and connect it back to the physics. And it's still work in progress. Uh, we have a draft on archive, but still in revision. Um, so I'll just uh, stop here and um, we'll be happy to answer any questions or any suggestions that you have. Hi, thanks, Yang. Um, one, one quick comment before I, um, you know, um, uh, uh, people who might have questions ask. So the, um, uh, can you go back two slides the, to your, um, no, no, the last one. Uh, they had the future uh, things to do. The results. Yeah, the time to event modeling. Um, so you, you mentioned that you're trying to do use uh, uh, to uh, model it as a Poisson process. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you that uh, it is not Poisson. Yeah. Uh, in fact, it's you know. Um, I blame Xiaoli actually, uh, because he, uh, we, I, I was trying to convince him that it's Poisson and he suggested various tests and it turned out to be much more over dispersed. So it's not. Because yeah, there are so many missing data. If you account for the missing data, definitely it's not Poisson. If you just use the raw observation, the thing is really that the locally, the strong flares are uh, suppressing the weak flares that we are having a lot of under-recorded flares. No, you, even if you just look at the strong flares, uh, you, even their numbers are uh, over dispersed relative to Poisson. Yeah, um, I'm not, you're talking about the intensity level or the flare? No, just, just the flare numbers and consequently also the, I mean, if, if you look at the um, arrival times of the flares, um, they are, the difference in the arrival times are not uh, exponential. Uh, I think the thing is that you cannot use a homogeneous Poisson distribution to right. really disrupt the flare events. The thing is that we really need inhomogeneity in the Poisson rates uh, to actually describe the flare arrival. I mean, Poisson distribution is like you could have prior distributions on the flare uh, on the on the Poisson rate to make it overly dispersed, uh, to make it more closer to negative binomial, for example. Uh -huh. uh, but the thing is that across time uh, and across active regions, there is no way of defining a homogeneity in terms of Poisson distribution. So you cannot use kind of summary statistics to, to really justify the Poisson process modeling. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the thing that we're working on is really that the, the flares are dependent of each other. If you observe a lot of C flares happening, then probably an MX flare is coming too. Oh. So we're trying to accommodate for the dependency of the flares and also the dependency on the sharp parameters jointly. All right, thank you.
but it's, uh, it's hard to fit. So yeah. that's why I don't present the results here yet. Right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, questions? There are no questions. Uh, no, I have a question, a comment, Mrs. Zanetta. So I was uh, wondering if, uh, you know, this is of course uh, the method applied to high quality images. And I was wondering about Poisson type images where we have features in the X-ray data, uh, for example, can, can this be used? You know, can we use the feature extraction? So you, you talked about the auto encoder method. Yeah. Yeah, I think the feature extraction from the auto encoder was actually pretty good because for the 20 sharp parameters that the uh, that the space scientists have, they spent years trying to understand the physics to come up with the 20 parameters. Right, so right. So yeah. the same prediction results almost. Uh, yeah, so this are all nice. magnetogram uh, images, Anita. So I don't know if we can use them directly. Uh, we'll have to do something different. Yeah, we would need to do something different than than those. But uh, you know, I I had this thought about you know detecting this faint features in the X-ray images. Um, so you know, right now we use LiRa and we use you know post processing, etc. But if we have this uh, images post process images, can we use those? Yeah. You know, it's just the, the, the thought which occurred during the talk because I, you know, I have different problem than solar physicists, but we still have the problem and uh, perhaps it would be nice to think about it in this different context. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's an effective feature extraction. And mm -hmm. for the dimension reduction, we spend some efforts because things like PCA does not, did not really work well. And we went for the marginal screening to screen out the features. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, but I think in different problems, probably different techniques work. Yeah, but it's nice. So, you know, one more thing to consider <laughs> for our high energy analysis. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what, I mean, if there are <clears throat> no more comments or uh, um, questions, I mean, I have one more. Uh, so you, you you make this prediction of the um, um, this, uh, the inter flare intensity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in principle, I guess you could use that as a way to predict your inhomogeneous Poisson process. Um, is that what you're planning to do? Yeah, we tie, tie that to into the next step. Yeah, there are two things. The the Poisson process has two responses. The the or two, it's like a two dimensional prediction. The first dimension is really the arrival time and the second dimension is really the, um, the, the logarithm of the intensity. And we're trying to regress both towards the history and also the uh, sharp parameters. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a plot here, but I can send you a plot of okay. the model that we're using. It's quite fun, but pretty hard to run. Yeah. Okay, uh, and yes, I mean, I, uh, we should also talk offline about um, uh, this Poisson uh, business. Yeah, because the power law, I guess, is gonna be helpful for us if you already pre uh, estimated the power law um, shape because the missingness in the flare, flare events is another mm. tricky thing in practice. Right. Because the machine gets easily confused because in the label, you don't label it as a flare event, but the sharp parameters is already demonstrating uh, strong big values and sharp increase. And yeah. it's, it's kind of difficult for the model to figure out whether it's a missed event or it's a really right. not no event. All right, uh, okay. So, uh, oh, we are almost exactly finishing up on time. So if there are any other questions, comments, last chances. Yeah, Vinay, is everyone else joining this? Um, 
this video call or we're going to move to a different video call? Uh, we should definitely stop this one and, uh, and move to the uh, other one. So let me stop and recording for now. Wait. Do, do I have a link yet? I can create one. If yeah, you... okay. Um, well, let, let me stop recording this one at least. Uh, done. Stop recording.